This is Understanding Romans video class number 41. And in today's video class, we're going to cover one of the most important subjects for us as children of God to understand, and that is predestination. And it's, it's been one of the most heated subjects uh, in, church, in the church, especially since the Reformation, even all the way up into the present. But I believe that you and I as children of God, it, it ought not to be something that we just know so we can debate about it, but it's so, it's so, so important for us to know it so we can uh, be blessed by it and experience it in our life. And so that's what this video class is all about. We're going to cover Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, and I encourage you to watch the whole video class to understand these two great verses in the Bible. It seems like I was saying over and over again in Romans chapter 8, but you know, a part of me that I want to go faster to get through the book of Romans, but at the same time, especially here in Romans 6, 7, and 8, uh, I don't want to go too fast because every verse is just loaded with spiritual wealth, and it's so needed uh, to understand in our walk with God and really and to know to know really all that Jesus has accomplished for us. And so uh, as we do at the beginning of every video class, let's have a word of prayer. And also, if you haven't done so already, again, subscribe to the Corner Ministries YouTube channel. Just press the little red icon at the bottom of the screen. Would love to hear your, you read your comments. Uh, you can email me if you want to, question Cornell Ministries 777 at gmail.com. Or you can comment your question uh, because the question that you have, probably other people have as well. And so don't be shy, all right? And then press the little uh, icon or the like button. That really does help as well. So let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And we're so thankful, Lord, for the privilege of studying your word. We ask you right now for the help of your spirit. I ask for your anointing to rest upon me and upon those who are watching. That, Lord, you would give us understanding of your word and, and help us in our walk with you, Lord. Help us to understand more and more all that you've done for us. And we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. If you want to type in an amen there, go ahead and, and do that. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to cover Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. And in last video class, uh, I gave the heading uh, that, that, through, that in the gospel, again, we have the help of the Holy Spirit. Again, we see that really from verses uh, 18 through 39, that the gospel supplies the help and hope, okay, in the midst of earthly trials. Uh, verses 18 through 25, through the Spirit, we eagerly wait for the, for the redemption of the body. In verses 26 and 27 and 28, really, we have the help of the Holy Spirit, okay, in our weaknesses. But I, I changed the, the heading a little bit here for these next two verses, 29 and 30, and I'm simply calling it the plan of God revealed or God's plan revealed. You can download these notes. It's in the top comment of this video. Click on the link and you can download the notes for all, really every video class in this Understanding Romans. You can uh, uh, download the notes for each one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it up on the screen as I always do the, these verses here, 29 and 30. Put myself on the side here. And it says, Paul writing, and he says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, in these verses, it seems as if Paul is changing the subject from the help of the Holy Spirit, okay, in the midst of this world, in the midst of trials, in the midst of our human weaknesses, to the subject of the, uh, of the plan of God. And in reality, he is, okay? And, 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 and at the very end of verse 28, he makes this statement, you can see on the screen there at the end of verse 28, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, what Paul is doing in verses 29 and 30 is he's, he is changing the subject somewhat, but what Paul is doing in verses 29 and 30 is actually expanding 
on the subject of what he ended verse 28 with, and that is the purpose of God. And so I didn't define the word purpose in the last video class when we covered verse 28, but I'm going to define it now, okay? At the end of verse 28, the word purpose, it means that which is planned or purposed in advance. It's his plan, proposal, or purpose. Uh, it's used, the same word, purpose, the purpose of God, okay, is used in Ephesians 1.11, where Paul writes this, in him also we have obtained an inheritance pre being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You see, God's purpose revealed is revealed in verses 29 and 30, the verses that we just read. His purpose is revealed in these verses. And that purpose, okay, that plan is really, it's the whole plan of salvation that we have in the gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and who He is and what He's accomplished for us through His death, the cross, and the fact that He rose from the dead. You see, the, the whole plan of salvation is in the person and work of Jesus. But Paul, what he does in these two verses is he gives us five words that that explain that purpose, that plan, okay? And I've said it, I've said it often in this Roman series, and I'll say it again for the sake of re, uh, refreshing your pure minds by remembrance, okay, that so often believers think of salvation as simply the, the door in which we get saved, okay, and we get in to salvation, we're saved from hell, okay, we're saved from our sins, we're not going to hell anymore again, we're now we're a child of God, and then after that, that's no longer salvation, okay, that's just us living out the Christian life, but that's really not the biblical understanding of salvation, and I go back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 for a moment when, when Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For, and then verse 17, For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We see, the gospel is all about uh, being saved, all right? And that word salvation, it, it's, it's actually the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And as I've mentioned before, biblical New Testament salvation is not just getting in the door, but it's actually Jesus is the door. That's John chapter, uh, John chapter ten, verse nine. Okay, he's he is the door, but he's also John fourteen six. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The word way means he's the road. So Jesus is. The, the door, but he's also the road that we walk on in this Christian life, this Christian journey of sanctification. So what Jesus accomplished for us in the gospel, okay, through his, through his death and the cross and his resurrection, is the means by which we are justified, but it's also the means by which we're sanctified, and the means by which one day we are glorified. And, and Paul, in these two verses, he uses five words to describe God's plan for every person that has ever lived. And those five words are this, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. In those five words is the whole plan of salvation, or it's salvation in its holistic sense, okay, as a whole, okay? Again, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. Now, get this, and you, you can download these notes if I'm going quickly through here. Uh, these five words, uh, since the Reformation, they've been called the five truths, 
five steps, five stages of salvation, okay, or the five great events of salvation. Uh, they've also been called many different things. One of the things they've been called often is God's chain of grace, God's chain of grace, or God's golden chain of salvation in these five words. Now, you know, book series have been written on these five words that are in these two verses, okay? But it, we're going to cover it. I'm going to cover it in just the next, you know, possibly 30 minutes, hopefully around there. Uh, but so much more could be said, but I'm going to summarize it and try to put it in a concise way, in a way that you can understand it. And all of us, we can understand it to help us in our walk with the Lord. Now, uh, in verse 29, it, he writes again, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, God's purpose for humanity, this is so important now, okay? God's purpose for humanity begins with his foreknowledge. Notice what Paul said. Again, he ends verse 28, to those who are called according to his purpose, that's his plan. Then he says this in regards to his plan, the great plan of salvation, okay? For whom he foreknew. So, again, God's plan of salvation begins with his foreknowledge, for, for whom he foreknew. Now, foreknew means this. It means to know beforehand as human foresight, or it can be understood as God's prophetic foreknowledge. Now, the word foreknew in the English, that is very much self-explanatory. It's knowing beforehand, and that's what the word foreknew literally means. I'm going to skip now to verse uh, verse 30 for a moment and explain the word De uh, predestination, okay, just uh, uh, just a quick definition of it for us to get it at this point in our in the video, okay? The word predestined it means to come to a decision beforehand, to decide beforehand, to determine ahead of time, to decide upon ahead of time. That's the idea of predestined. It also can be understood as to pre-choose. All right, to predestine, to pre-choose. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in the church, especially since the Reformation, there has been so much heated debate and division over this subject of predestination. And I'll include the, I, the thought of here foreknowledge as well, because they're, they're both connected together, okay, in this passage. And biblically, they're connected together. Foreknowledge, predestination. There's so much debate, so much division. Personally, I believe that, that it's very unfortunate that, been, that there has been so much division in the church over this, this subject. I think it's important for us to know and understand foreknowledge and predestination. I, let me just say this from the very beginning. I believe strongly in the biblical doctrine of predestination. Okay, I believe very strongly in it. But the big question is, what does it mean biblically? Now, there are two main doctrines, okay, doctrinal beliefs that, that come under two different terms, okay, and they are Calvinism and Arminianism. Let me say that again. Calvinism and Arminianism. Now, there are several different variations, many variations of beliefs under these two doctrinal headings, okay, of Calvinism and Arminianism. But in this video, I'm going to basically summarize the main beliefs as it concerns both of these two doctrinal stances, okay? Uh, Calvinism, number one, you can download these notes again, by the way, and I've also provided another handout on uh, the differences between Arminianism and Calvinism explained. You can see it on the top comment, and it will explain these in a little more detail, okay? Now, Calvinism, in a nutshell, especially as it concerns the, the idea of predestination, is the belief that because God is sovereign, that means in complete control, he's the complete authority or figure, okay, 
And because of man's depravity, because of sin, mankind has no ability within himself to have faith in Christ. Therefore, okay, now get this, this is Calvinism, because God is sovereign, he's in complete control, and because of man's depravity, so depraved that he doesn't have a free will, okay, that's Calvinism, this is understanding of Calvinism, therefore, because of that, God has pre- destined or pre-chosen those who will believe in Christ and thus predestined or pre-chosen those who will not believe in Christ. So that means condemnation, all right? That means eternal separation from God forever and ever. Now, this doctrine of Calvinism did not begin with John Calvin in the late 1500s. It's important to understand it didn't begin with John Calvin during the time of the Reformation. This basic belief that I just described to you, okay, goes all the way really back to Augustine. It was really put together or formulated to some degree by Augustine, uh, a church leader in the, in the uh, 400s AD. But what John Calvin did is he expanded on what Augustine taught to a degree that no one in church history has ever done, pre previous to him or even after John Calvin. Now, I want to mention this about John Calvin, okay? So much, boy, you could do a class, a series on the history of the Reformation. And personally, I've had the privilege of studying uh, the history of the Reformation about five or six different times in Bible college, and it's an incredible study. I absolutely love it. But I'm summarizing this here, okay? But what has to be understood about John Calvin is this, first of all, that he was a true reformer. He was a true reformer in this sense that he, that he taught the five pillars of the Reformation, and that is Christ alone, that's sola Christo, okay? Uh, grace alone, sola gracia. Uh, uh, glory to God alone, sola glorias, okay? of the authority, the authority of Scripture alone, sola scriptura, it's called in the Latin, those sola words are, are Latin, okay? And then the priesthood of believers under Christ alone, okay? So those are the five main pillars of the Reformation, those five main doctrines. John Calvin very much taught those, that, and that made him a true reformer. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what John Calvin did was he expanded on what Augustine did to a point that it's never been done before, and Calvinism can be summarized in five main points, and sometimes this is referred to as the tulip principle. Tulip, just like a flower, okay, tulip flower, T-U-L-I-P, okay, that's the tulip principle, the five main doctrines of Calvinism, and it's basically this, okay? And you can find this on the handout that I've given you as well. Number one is the total depravity of men. The tulip, as I go back for a moment, tulip is an acronym referring to the five main doctrines of Calvinism. Number one, the T is total depravity of men to the point of having no free will, all right? Number two, the U, unconditional election. That means God chooses all who will be saved unconditionally, regardless of their of will. They're, again, man has no free will under Calvinism. All right, number three, the L, limited atonement. Now, if you disagree with any of the first two, okay, you're really going to disagree with number three. Limited atonement means this, under Calvinism, that Christ only died for those that God has predestined to be saved. That means he did not die for the world, okay? He didn't die for the world, as John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, who, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but of everlasting life, okay? Limited atonement under Calvinism is the belief that Jesus only died for the church, those who are pre-elected 
to be saved. All right. Now, again, I personally, well, you know, let me, I'm not going to get, I mean, let me just go through this. All right. Number four is irresistible grace. The I, irresistible grace. God's grace, that is God's grace drawing the elect to salvation and it cannot be resisted. And then number five is the perseverance of the saints. That's the P, perseverance of the saints, that a person's perseverance to believe in Christ to the time of death was the indication of one's election to be saved. What that means is a person has to believe all the way to the time of death. And get this, if they don't, if they at some point, maybe if they get saved, but then some years or month or year, it could be, it could be 50 years. It could be any time down the road in their life, they backslide, okay, and they don't believe anymore, okay, that means they didn't persevere to the end, and that, under covetism, that is indicative that God never elected them to begin with, or as many times covenants say, they were never saved to begin with. That's how covenants get away with that saying. Okay, if someone backslides, they turn back, they're back on the faith, they will say of them that were never saved to begin with, and that is the Calvinistic doctrine of perseverance of the saints. In other words, you have to persevere all the way to the time of death, and that is the indication that you're saved. Really, you know, and I think in reality, that's almost, the, you know, sometimes uh, what is tagged to Calvinism is the, the thought of, un, uh, of unconditional eternal security, okay? Unconditional eternal security. Well, really, with the perseverance of the saints, that whole belief, I think it's eternal. It's 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 eternal insecurity. All right, because you don't know if you're saved, okay, until the end of your life. Okay, it's the it's this thought. It's this nagging uh, uh, sensation on the inside of boy. I hope I make it to the end, because if I don't, man, I'm not even saved, and I was never elected to begin with. Can you imagine living like that? But that is that doctrine. Okay, now Arminianism is the belief that because of God's love for humanity, in spite of humanity's depravity and sin, God has graced, he's given grace to every person, and and grace, again, is a free gift in this sense, that he's given man a free will. It's the grace of free will to choose to believe in Christ or not to believe. So each person's eternity is determined by one freely accepting God's grace or rejecting God's grace. Now, most believers in the church have heard of Calvinism, or if they live that very long for the Lord, they will hear of, quote, Calvinism. But most believers will not normally hear of the word Arminianism. Most of the time, the word Arminianism is basically understood as free will. Do you believe in free will? Yes, I believe in free will. And the term free will is used as a as a words that I'm not Calvinist, okay? But in theologically and historically, again, it's called Arminianism. Now, I've included, again, the handout, as I mentioned earlier. It's right here about the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism, also some history about the man uh, Arminius, from which, we, from which we get the word Arminianism from, okay? And you can download that. I encourage you to do so. Now, one thing that's very, very important that I want to highlight before we get on and move on to these scriptures here is this. It has to do with the scriptural basis by which both of these doctrinal stances come from, all right? Let me read this just from the handout, okay? The scriptural basis for Calvinism was their view of the sovereignty of God as the core characteristic of God seen throughout the Bible, 
Now, this is very, very important to understand about Calvinism. The very core, at the very core of Calvinism is the sovereignty of God. That strong belief that God is sovereign to the point that he is in complete control of world events. And again, there's different variations of this within the camp of Calvinism. Some are very extreme with it. With the, I mean, to the, to, the, to the extreme of, you know, if I go out and I, um, uh, anybody, if, as a, I'm talking now as a believer, no. Okay, and now, if I go out as a believer and I go kill someone or I go get drunk, all right, that means that God predestined me to do that. Okay, that is the extreme side of Calvinism. And I'll say this, Calvin, Calvin never taught that. That is not real Calvinism, that extreme view, that if I go out and do something evil and sin, then that means God predestined me to do it. Absolutely no. But it is, again, that's within some camps of Calvinism. Uh, but again, the very core of Calvinism is the sovereignty of God, that God is in complete control. Now, get this. The scriptural basis for Arminianism is the love of God that is seen throughout the Bible. And so these, that's very, very important to understand the differences between the two. Calvinism, sovereignty. Arminianism, the love of God. And and you see, uh, in, in Calvinism, the whole idea is that God is in complete control. At the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God is the one that predestined the fall to happen. Okay? He predestined evil to happen. And he predestined a plan, a salvation plan, okay, in the Lamb of God, okay, that is seen in the Bible that the Lamb, that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's no, that's sovereignty, and they Calvinists believe that. But they, they, the idea is again complete control. In Arminianism, there's still the belief in in sovereignty, and I'll mention this as well. In Calvinism, there's still a, there's still the belief in God's love. But it's not the same as Arminianism. In, in Arminianism, again, there's still a belief in sovereignty. Like for myself, okay, I would be viewed theologically, and maybe many of you would as too, as Arminianists. We believe in, in free will, but we believe in the sovereignty of God. And actually, the fact that we know that God's in control is, is one of the greatest joys in our life as a child of God. But not to the point that God is in control that he's some puppet master up in heaven and he's pulling all the strings of every person. No, he's given us free will. And so in the garden under Calvinism, God predestined everything to take place just the way it did. And under Arminianism, God's love, okay, in God's love never, never was sin. Okay, the will and the plan in the plan of God. It was never in the plan of God. Now, God foreknew it was going to happen, but it was not his plan. In Calvinism, it was his plan. In Arminianism, it was not his plan, but God foreknew what was going to happen. And out of love for mankind, he provided the the solution before there was ever a problem. So at the very core, again, of Arminianism is the characteristic of God's love. And you know what? When, when you read, especially the New Testament, the Gospels, and all the epistles of Paul and Peter and John and James, okay, um, you see at the very core of the Gospel of why Jesus came was not the sovereignty of God, but it was the love of God. For example, again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was not for God was in control because God is in control. God gave his only begotten son. No, it was his love. Now, well, again, I'll mention this, and this is really in these two verses that God, that Paul, well, being led by the spirit here, is showing us that 
again, that God's plan of salvation is all God. Okay, God knew everything. He is God. And he, because he's omniscient, and the omniscient means all-knowing, and because he's omnipotent, that means all-powerful, okay? He provided the plan of salvation, and his plan of salvation is a great plan, okay? And it's a plan that involves everything that we need, okay, as a, as a, as a child of God, to be restored to perfect relationship with him, even better than it was with Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I, I've said this sometimes, but Revelation 21 and 22 is better than Genesis 1 and 2. Okay? And so the end, because of the cross, okay, the end is better than the beginning. Because when God restores something out of his love for humanity, okay, when God restores something, he makes it better than it was before. And get, I'll, I'll say this as well, that, it, that in true and real love, there has to be a choice. If God forces love upon someone, is that really love? Okay, that's like a prearranged marriage. Is that really love? No. No, love a true marriage, and we're married to Christ, okay? That's Romans chapter 7, verse 4, all right? We're married to him. We're joined together with him. Uh, if it's just prearranged without any love on my part, then that's not much of a marriage. But when it is freely from the heart out of love, and our, from the heart we are responding to what God has given us and is giving us, and we respond, okay, with a yes, a, 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 a yes of faith, I believe, okay? That is, that's love. That's love. I want to move on here for the sake of time. In verse 29 again, again, for whom he foreknew. Again, God's plan for mankind begins with his foreknowledge. Again, as I mentioned this earlier, but foreknew, it means to know beforehand as human foresight or God's prophetic foreknowledge. Now, that is a literal and basic understanding of the word foreknew. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 is what Peter says, all right? Uh, different apostles, same understanding of foreknowledge. He said, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You get that? We, it refers to us as the elect. We're, we're elected. We are pre-chosen, okay, by God. But he said this, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That refers again to being saved, all right? So, God's predestination of us is based on the truth that he is omniscient and all-knowing and that he foreknew the decision that we would freely make when the gospel was presented to each one of us. I Personally, I think that makes perfect sense. No. And because that's a literal, basic understanding now, Calvinists, it really, it's, it amazes me, Calvinists amaze me in how they get around the literal meaning of different passages. For example, like this one, they get around the literal meaning by redefining words. I, I'm amazed by it. You know, Calvinists also, often what they will do in verses like this, Romans 8, 29, and 1 Peter 1, 2, and others, okay, for example, these two verses here, Romans 8, 9, and 1 Peter 1, 2, is they will say, they will redefine the word for new as, as meaning this, that the word for new means to, it means to for love. So it really doesn't mean to for no, okay, but it just simply means to for love, that he loved us beforehand, all right? But you know what? That for love and for new changes their two different meanings altogether. And 
uh, or, or by saying this, that the word for new means to decide beforehand. Not to know, okay, but to decide beforehand. Therefore, and you'll find this in, co- in, in commentaries written by those who believe in Calvinism, or at least this aspect of Calvinism, that they'll say that in verse 29 that the word for no or for new is a synonym of the word predestined. But that in itself doesn't even make sense that for whom he, that would be like saying, for whom he predestined, he also predestined to be conformed. Okay, no, no. Whom he foreknew. Two different meanings from predestined. Now, I'll mention this as well, that a Calvinist uh, once told me, this is many years ago, I was 16 years old actually, and a uh, Calvinist man uh, sat me down one day. He wanted to explain something to me. I went to a Christian uh, school that was Baptist, and they were were Calvinists, all right? Not all Baptists are Calvinists, but this one was. And he explained to me in brief, in brief, okay, he said, asked me the question, do you know John 3, 16? I said, of course I do, for God so loved the world, all right? And the, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but of everlasting life. And he said this to me. He said, it's so important to understand that in John 3, 16, when it, when, it, when it says, for God so loved the world, that it's so important to understand that the word world really means church. So when you read it, you, ought to, you need to understand it this way, for God so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son. And, when he, and, he, and he was saying that to me, with that, again, that whole Calvinistic belief system. And I get this, I knew, even at a young age, as a teenager, I knew that what he was saying was not right. Because I knew this, that when Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he meant the world. That's everybody that's ever existed. And world doesn't mean church. If he said, if it meant church, he would have said church. But in this brother, in this man's thinking, he was saying that really God only came and Jesus only died for the church, not for everyone. Get this. I believe personally that that's heresy. Again, going back to the idea of limited atonement, that Jesus only died for those who have been pre-selected by God to be saved. I believe that is heresy. It doesn't agree with God's word, okay? The whosoever, all the whosoever's throughout the Bible mean exactly that, whosoever will. That means God has given to every person, even in our depraved state, okay, even in the state that we, in the condition that we've been born in sin, he's given us the ability, the will to believe or not to believe. And I'll mention this as well in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith in and of itself is a gift, okay, that comes from God, and it comes, get this, it comes with the presentation of the word. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So whenever there is a revelation of God, okay, there at the same time, whether it's on paper, or whether it's verbal, or whether it's just by the Spirit, someone has a dream, or just the Holy Spirit working on someone, all right? Whenever there is a revelation of God, there is the faith that comes with it to believe in God. Now, out of our own free will, whenever that faith comes, okay, it's a gift that comes with the revelation we can choose to believe or we can choose not to believe. We can choose to accept that gift of faith or we can choose to not to accept that gift of faith. That is consistent with God's word. Now, he mentioned also this. He said uh, in verse 29, he also, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That word predestined again, it means to come to a decision beforehand. It means 
that before it ever happened, God made a decision about it. And I'll mention this as well about predestination, that some believe, and some within Calvinism and some within Arminianism, some believe that people are not predestined, just the plan of salvation was predestined. Now, definitely the plan of salvation was predestined by God, again, according to his foreknowledge. But also people, us individually, we are predestined. But again, it's all according to his foreknowledge. Okay, now his plan for us in part here is that that we are conformed to the image of his son. Now, that idea of being conformed to the image of his son, it means that we are it, that we are conformed, that we are conformed to the character of Jesus Christ. That we, again, we're the body of Christ. That we, as Christ is, we are on this earth as salt and light. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the representatives of Jesus in this world. Uh, showing forth his character, which is the fruit of the Spirit. That is being conformed to the image of his Son. That is on this side of glory. Now, we'll mention this, that being conformed to the image of his Son includes the glorification event, being glorified. Okay? Because oh, that's, that's ultimately being conformed to the image of his Son, that as Christ is glorified, we also will be glorified. All right? I want to mention that. He also goes on to say that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, that word, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Paul, led by the Spirit, uses a family-type language in referring to Christ and all of those who've been born again. Now, I will mention this, that in back in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, earlier on this passage, Paul, uh, again, being led by the Spirit, referred to us as children of God, we're, we're heirs of God and we're joint heirs with Christ. Of all that Jesus accomplished for us at the cross, okay? We are joint heirs with him. So that's family. We're family with God, okay? Family with Jesus, joint heirs with him. Paul, with that fa same figurative term here or language, an idea, he uses the term that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The idea of firstborn, okay, especially in Jewish society, and it, I think it needs to be taken this way to some degree, that in Jewish society, right, the, the, the rights and the responsibilities of being the firstborn son resulted in considerable prestige and status. The firstborn son, for example, now this is in Jewish society, but it also can be applied to us spiritually to some degree, actually even to a greater degree. But the firstborn son, for example, received twice as much as the inheritance as any other offspring. So, the idea of Christ being the firstborn means that he is greater, that even though we're joint heirs with him, okay, and he calls us brethren, that's incredible. But he calls us brethren, okay? He is the firstborn. He has he is so much greater than we are. Okay? We have what we have because he did what he did. You see, he did what we could not do, and that was uh, have a perfect birth, live a perfect life and culminating in this perfect all atoning sacrificial atoning death at the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the dead, okay? And we, by faith in him and what he's done, we are joined together with him. So, okay, so because we're joined together with him, we become one with him. But get this, we're not the same as him. There's only one Jesus. And that's in Philippians chapter uh, uh, 3, or 2, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, where Paul explained that God has given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And why did, you, why did God do that? Because he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Only that, 
can be applied to Jesus. Again, that's him being the firstborn. Hallelujah. But then it says in verse 30, and we'll go through verse 30 somewhat quickly because we've already covered quite a bit and also for the sake of time. He says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, again, we, we already covered that, it means decide beforehand, these he also called. Now the word called simply means to be summoned to God's plan. All right? Now, uh, then he also says to those he called, they, those he also, these he also justified. Justified, as we've seen throughout the book of Romans, means to, make, to be made righteous. He declares us righteous. And by, de by declaring us righteous, he makes us righteous. Okay? In the sight of God. All, again, through what Christ has accomplished for us and our union with him, our faith in him. And, you know, Paul made it very clear, uh, especially in, in, in the Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5, okay, that we are justified by faith. And it's the faith of the individual. All right? It's so, so important to understanding predestination. Okay? He did not, he did not, it doesn't say that we are justified according to the predestination of God. He said we are justified by faith. That is an act of the heart. And Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, out of the heart man believes. Okay? Now, that's huge. So, it's so important as it concerns justification. We're not justified according to predestination. We're justified by faith. And then he says, those, these he, those he justified, these he also glorified. Now, glorification is the final event in God's great plan of salvation that we have in Jesus, okay? And glorified here, it, it means, as we've talked about in previous classes, it means when all the effects of the fall, all the effects of sin and death are removed from us, and we are changed, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 through 56, okay, we are, this mortal becomes immortal. All the effects of sin and the, and the fall are all removed, and we are changed. This mortal becomes immortal. This corruptible becomes incorruptible. We become like Christ is in his glorified state, and that is completely sinless and perfect, okay? All through, again, Christ. That's glorified together with him. Now, Paul here, and when he says that these he whom he justified, these he also glorified. The word glorified there is actually in the past tense, okay? Eros tense. But it's it's referred to by some as a prophetic past tense, meaning that Jesus' finished work of the cross guarantees that we'll be glorified. All those who believe in him, that is, will be glorified. Okay, it's all in God's plan for us. Okay, it's all in God's plan for us, all in the great plan of salvation. Praise the Lord. You see, God didn't plan anybody to just live, you know, start out with a flame of fire, you know, I'm on fire for God, and then we just flame out. No, that's not God's plan, not his will for anybody. Neither is that indicative that, well, that person was never saved to begin with. No. Well, it can be that, possibly, but only God knows ultimately. But you see, we can rest in the finished work of Jesus. And I want to end today's video class with that. We can rest in the finished work of Christ. We can rest assured of the great salvation that we have in Jesus. Is there security in the salvation that we have in Christ, okay? Absolutely yes. And I'll say this as we as we close. We're not saved one day and we and that the next day because we sinned, we're not saved anymore. Okay? That's that's uh, eternal insecurity. Okay, we, there's no such thing biblically as eternal insecurity. No, we are secure in Christ. We're in his hand. And Jesus said, if we're in his hand, then no, no, no one can take us out of his hand. And so we can rest assured that we are, we are, we are complete in him. We're secure in him. 
And so whenever we do fail the Lord, we can go back to Him and not get saved all over again, but we can, we can repent of our sin. We can ask God to forgive us and ask Him to renew our mind. Renew, that's why we need our minds renewed every day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Again, rest in the finished work of Jesus. God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus.